Hi everyone, my name is Alexandra and welcome to my channel. Or welcome back if you've been here before. The programmed series investigates the many forms of mental manipulation. This first video focuses on the method of mass indoctrination. There's a lot of good in this world, yes, but that is not what's gotten us to this tipping point. These videos are to present the information and my opinions will be discussed in the conclusion video at the end of the series. So let's get started. There are three main things we'll discuss in this video. One, how our minds are exploited. Two, how to identify social contagions. And three, look at information regarding the many organizations involved in mass indoctrination. Who built your frame of reference? No one likes to be taken advantage of, especially when it's their mind that's being exploited. Your mind guides your thoughts and your thoughts guide your actions. Social engineering or managing social change to regulate the behavior of a society is carried out in various ways. One example is the Hegelian dialectic. Problem, reaction, solution. But what if those steering the collective, and we'll get into this later, are only interested in their goals or conclusions? How do they go about convincing the public to go along with radical and damaging new ideas? They use the Hegelian dialectic, and over time, usually decades to generations, their end goal is achieved. Yuri Bezmanov, a former KGB agent, explains how long it takes to subvert or degrade a culture's morality. I suggest watching his full presentation on how to take over a country to get a better idea of how we got to this point, especially in the US. Link to his video and any relevant references is in the description below. Various areas where public opinion is formulated or shaped. Religion, educational system, social life, administration, law enforcement system, military, of course, and labor and employer relations, economy. Okay? It takes from, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why, why 15 or 20 years? This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation, one lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No more, no less. Usually it takes from 15 to 20 years. The narrative and the predictable counter-narrative are all accounted for. When they steer you one way, some people go the other. But that doesn't work when they have accounted for both directions. You don't have to play their game. You don't have to buy the narrative or the counter-narrative. You cannot win this game, but you can stop playing. While most of us recognize that advertisers are trying hard to entice us to spend money, it's easy to forget how they do this. By increasing our awareness of their tactics, perhaps we can better resist impulse buying. Likewise, by increasing our awareness of mind control tactics, we can more effectively resist programming. Technology is essential to our modern lives, and it's not all bad. It's how we connect and keep in contact with people. But this series puts a spotlight on the destructive and negative psychological manipulation which is by far more prevalent than positive manipulation. For example, desensitization in media could be used for good, such as showing positive attitudes towards disabled or elderly people, but instead it's used to push extreme agendas. It may or may not seem obvious, but like it or not, we're being manipulated. Our attention is steered, cognitive biases exploited, subconscious influenced, in the world around us orchestrated. As humans, we want to feel in control, like we're driving the car. But just because you're behind the steering wheel doesn't mean your car isn't being towed. There are endless ways we're influenced, such as subliminals, propaganda, psychological warfare, social contagions, peer pressure, exploiting cognitive biases, and conditioning that limits creativity, originality, and potential. 
There are many more forms, but we will be discussing the most common ones today. The old standards of flat-out shame, embarrassment, and fear are still very effective at keeping people under control. Gaslighting is another tactic which includes the manipulator instilling false and one-sided information to the victims, making them doubt their cognition, memory, and mental state, thus distrusting themselves and blindly obeying the other party. Thinking has been exchanged for being told what to do. Subliminal perception, a method to keep the subject unaware of the source of their stimulation. The desire is not to keep them unaware of what they are doing, but rather to keep them unaware of why they are doing it, by masking the external cue or message with subliminal presentation and so stimulating an unrecognized motive. This involves everything from traditions to addictively checking your phone. You don't really know why you're doing the things you're doing. Where we are today is the result of generations in the making. All of history adds up, like a snowball, accumulating as time goes on. Our world has become more and more interconnected, and media is virtually inescapable. Social media has revolutionized how people create and consume information. Unlike the broadcasts of traditional media, which are passively consumed, social media depends on users to deliberately propagate the information they receive to their social contacts. This process, called social contagion, can amplify the spread of information in a social network. The age of synchronized programming is coming to a close with the decline of cable and rise of streaming services. That's because we have been conditioned to be entertained with our phones as opposed to doing things like going outside. If the TV is off, that doesn't mean psychological manipulation isn't happening. Propaganda is inescapable in our modern world exactly as it was designed to be. Most of us are familiar with the concept of subliminals, which are hidden suggestions that only our subconscious perceives. They can be audio, hidden behind music, or visual, airbrushed into a picture, flashed on a screen so fast that you don't consciously see them, or cleverly incorporated into a picture or design. Subliminal messaging, or subliminal messages, are visual or auditory stimuli that the conscious mind cannot perceive, often inserted into other media such as TV commercials and songs. This kind of messaging can be used to strengthen or heighten the persuasiveness of advertisements, or to convey an altogether different message entirely. Clickbait is another form of programming. You get source amnesia because you read a headline, but you don't know where you heard it, or if it's even true. One example most of us believe is the lie that the way to achieve good eyesight is to eat carrots. Carrots are good for many things. But that myth came from a World War II propaganda campaign to confuse German pilots. The average person sees somewhere between 4,000 and 10,000 advertisements every day. Ads are designed to change your opinion about a brand or a product. Most assume the reason for ads is to show you a product or service and make you want to pick up the phone and buy it. But that's not entirely true. Why do brands that have universal recognition, so much so that they advertise this very fact, still pay to advertise? Because this is an ad with no logo. Because it's not about getting you to buy something once. It's about building reputation and brand image. Cults use this tactic as well. It's called building rapport. We will take a look at cults in part two of this series. The more familiar you are with something, the more comfortable you feel. Things you love and brands you trust. The same tactic is used to familiarize the public with celebrities, artists, ideologies, and political officials. Exposure to a brand makes the consumer comfortable and feel as if they know it. Before the 80s, brands were usually things. After the 80s, brands also became people. Exposure equals recognition, which equals trust. Repeated exposure to a product in order to associate a positive effect to it is in fact the most common approach in advertising. Another advertising trick is priming. That's when ads show us a specific behavior to condition us to emulate it. It isn't just ads that do this. Predictive programming can fit into this category as well. 
Do you think major companies would spend tens of billions on these tactics if they were not effective? This trick has a much darker side. It's often used in social engineering to get taboo topics to become assimilated into culture. Propaganda normalizes something taboo. When something is repeated enough times, it becomes normalized. And once it's not stigmatized anymore, it's accepted. Once accepted, it's nearly impossible to reject. We start to hear it over and over and over again, and then it starts to normalize the idea of, oh, maybe this isn't such a bad thing. Right. But you know what? Women are owning theirs right now. And Absolutely. They just need to sit back and just let us rock out. Because when you got so many really high-profile ladies that are singing along to this song yes. and going with it as well, just sit down. The best example of the next method is to start with the word Pavlov. Notice I didn't say Pavlov's dogs or explain what I was talking about. But chances are most of you proved his point of conditioning by associating his last name to the dog experiment. Association through correlation or affective conditioning. The way Pavlov trained the dogs to associate the sound of the bell with food, brands associate positive feelings, images, or ideas with their product so you subconsciously relate the two. Zero sugar. Still swearing off. Another example is Coca-Cola's holiday campaign, which actually changed the face of Santa, Santa Claus. Claus. Well, in 1931, the Coca-Cola company was trying to find a way to associate Coca-Cola with the holidays. Just ask anyone what Santa Claus looks like. He's wearing a red suit with uh, dark leather boots. Very curly beard gentleman. The bright red head with the white fur around it. You are not responsible for the programming you received as a child, but as an adult, you are responsible for being aware of it. The first step to knowing how to break free is recognizing you're in a cage. Learn to read between the lines and not take things at face value, like the news we are given every day. Understand why certain stories are given to us and others are never reported. One of the most overlooked forms of manipulation is information control. People seek escapism from depressing news, much like they turned to the cinema in the 1930s. This is an example of social engineering. The depressing news is overwhelming, which causes us to seek refuge from the relentless programming by going to entertainment as an escape. Cinema is a multidimensional art capable of affecting our neurophysiologic structure in different ways. Studies show that different parts of the brain are activated while watching a structured film, and consequently, the movie imitates consciousness structure. This imitation of the consciousness structure enables cinema to deeply influence the brain. The effect and its manner are the main themes of the newly emerged science of neurocinema. The problem is that media of all kinds is one of the most powerful forms of psychological manipulation, not any different from the relentless news cycles. Entertainment has consequences. Be careful what you choose to consume. Thought conditioning is also done interactively via social media. For example, trending posts on sites like Reddit, Tumblr, or Facebook are manipulated by algorithms specifically to be seen by as many as possible or to promote certain narratives under the guise of seeming organic. The inverse is also true. They suppress information and opinions that are not in favor of whatever change they wish to achieve. Maybe anything that moves young and impressionable minds is orchestrated to some extent, like the hippie movement of the 60s and 70s. Control of the narrative is essential for control of the people. There are five steps of social manipulation. One, building trust, confidence, or rapport. Two, questioning old ideas. This is the entry phase to suggesting new ideas. This is also philosophical Hegelian dialectics. Three, injecting new ideas. Four, persuasion. And five, reinforcing new ideas and framework. There's power in repetition and thought conditioning. People stick to things like their political party, favorite news sources, or friend groups, instead of looking at other sources or learning what others believe. Confirmation bias is when you search for information that conforms to your existing beliefs. 
This is why the Mockingbird media begins to question old ideas and inject new ones because people will go along with what those they trust are suggesting. Controlling the narrative is not relegated to nonfiction. Fiction also impacts reality. Fiction impacts people, people impact reality, therefore fiction does actually impact reality. In between the shows children and adults watch are many ads, on TV or on devices. Research shows that children younger than 8 don't understand what a commercial is and often accept their claims as fact. Alright, that's all fine, but why are these advertisers vying for our attention? Is it really some random, chaotic soup of companies clamoring for seconds of random individuals' attention? Or is there a logical and organized reason the most powerful financial corporations in the world put money behind social engineering not to win a single individual, but to steer the collective as a whole? You don't just have to be sold a product. You can be sold a lifestyle. It is said that fame is a byproduct of greatness. You can choose to believe that, but it's missing half the story. Children have a limited frame of reference, and they know limited options. When someone asks a child what they want to be when they grow up, some say, I want to be famous. Why? Because that's what they're sold. The Kardashians, they've been brilliant. They epitomize the idea that everyone can be famous if they, you know, create the right brand. The lie of fame has been marketed as glamorous and desirable to American children and teens for decades. Girls used to sit in soda shops to be discovered like Lana Turner. Today, people use social media as a way to be discovered like how Scooter Brown, quote, discovered Justin Bieber or the way Little Nas X used mimetic magic to catapult himself into the spotlight. As highlighted in the documentary Fake Famous, families, influencers, and some who even travel overseas paid $2,000 each to come here on an Instagram vacation just to take a photo against a flat pink wall. They're looking for this, likes, which translates to more followers which is the current currency of the most important thing on earth today. What everyone seems to be obsessed with, they want to be famous. Children do not grasp the concept of the entertainment industry. They understand that things they like to do, such as playing and singing and expressing themselves, are all an extension of acting. I, I love acting. It doesn't feel like work for me. So it doesn't it feels feel, like it feels like, it feels like going home and playing on your phone. It's not like, it's, it's so, I mean... It's like the best thing ever. It, it's nice because I, most of the subjects I do and uh, some of the things like maths and, I know, science, I mean, you feel like you're doing work. So when I was acting, I felt like I was just uh, exploring and having fun. Mm. So I didn't really have to, you know... Um, it wasn't as hard work for my mind because I was just, I was doing something I do. Fame is targeted at children in countless mediums such as magazines, music, television, and movies. The glamour of being adored, of being rich, having all sorts of nice things, and living what looks like a fun life. Who wouldn't want that? You'd have to be crazy to not want that. I thought you were done playing nerve. Hell no. The girl who won Seattle now has millions of followers. Oh. She is insta-famous. Who cares? I care. The if we knew what these people were going through, we would never support this industry. But we'll talk about that in the seventh part of this series. The point is that popular culture is driven by the companies that control it all.
The difference today is that the programming is so tight that we don't need ads in movies like we used to in order to be manipulated. Young kids and adults alike are influenced by social media. The hypnotist in our pockets. Club Libby Lou is one example of the bizarre early 2000s trends of teen and child clubs. Tube tops, tight pants, nail polish, makeup, all of that was in during the early 2000s era of pop stars and socialites. The emulation of tabloid figures had reached the masses and they were eager to participate. Remember, this was way before social media. It was selling a dangerous message that if you teach your daughters that they have to look good to succeed and the outer beauty is what matters most, that's what they'll believe. But occasional exposure to something is nothing compared to constant exposure over time. As children, we watch shows made for children. The shows are generally meant to teach a lesson or show you behavior that is preferable to be imitated. One of the greatest lies we believe is that, as adults, we stop learning the same way. What we watch influences our behavior whether we acknowledge it or not. The principal characters in children's shows, mainly on Nickelodeon and Disney, strove for fame, not greatness, nor positive causes, but fame. That is some voice you have. I'm Beverly Jones. I manage singing talent. Are you wrapped? Thanks. Uh, wrapped? You know, d do you have an agent? Starting tomorrow, I'm going to school with my celebrity sis. I'll miss you, paparazzi. When I walk through this door, I will be just another regular 15-year-old girl. Let's do this. Meet Tori Vega. Student, sister, singer. I've seen what you can do on stage. You're special. She was just a regular girl. These kids are all artsy and talented, and I'm just normal. Hi, I'm China Ann McLean, and I play a musical prodigy named China Parks on Disney Channel's newest comedy, Ant Farm. Hey there, people of Earth. <laughs> I'm Carly Shea, and this is our very first webcast of a little show we call I Carly. She's Carly. She's Sam. Sam I am. Carly. Sam. I think they're clear. And, of course, the phenomenon that obsessed an entire generation with becoming a pop star, American Idol. This is the stage where singers become superstars. And this is American Idol. What if I also told you that the vast majority of chart-topping music in the past 20 years was written by just two people? What do Britney Spears, Taylor Swift, Ellie Goulding, Robin Thicke, Jesse J, Justin Bieber, Katy Perry, Ariana Grande, Justin Timberlake, Maroon 5, Pink, Leona Lewis, Avril Lavigne, Christina Aguilera, Kesha, The Backstreet Boys, Westlife, NSYNC, Adam Lambert and Will I Am all have in common? The answer, their songwriter. I'm not saying 100% of their songs, but a good chunk of all these artists' songs were written by the same Swedish man, a Mr. Max Martin. This one man is single-handedly responsible for over two dozen number one singles and thousands of songs in the top 100 charts over the past decades. He has written universally recognisable tracks such as I Kissed a Girl, Baby One More Time, Since You've Been Gone, California Girls, Shake It Off and so, so many more. And if Max Martin didn't write it, then American singer-songwriter Lucas Gottwald most probably did. Known professionally as Dr. Luke, together with Max Martin, they account for the lyrics and melodies behind the vast majority of pop music today. You've likely never heard of them, and that is very intentional. 
These two men are the hidden pop factories behind virtually every single band that is played on the radio today, and probably every musical act you grew up with if you're under 30 years old. Many times record labels would pump thousands of pounds into an act that weren't destined to be, and their gamble wouldn't pay off losing their investment. But when they signed the really big acts, it would balance the books. However, today, promoting a new band is more expensive than ever. Over time, the cost of breaking in a new artist onto the global music scene has skyrocketed. In fact, the IFPI reports that today, it costs anywhere between half a million and three million dollars to sign a new act and break them into the music scene. That's a hell of a lot of money. Would you want to gamble with $3 million? No, neither do music producers. So, the industry has reacted by removing the risk. Instead of trying to find genuine musical talent, they simply take a pretty young face, usually from a TV talent show, and then simply force the public to like them. What that is, in fact, is the record label's $3 million making sure that that new single is quite literally everywhere, completely unescapable. You will hear it whether you want to or not. It really is a game of who you know, not what you know or how talented you are. Some exceptions obviously exist, but overall, effort does not reap a reward in the fame machine. A celebrity who's based their entire persona off of the idolatry of pop culture is the internet star Poppy. Born Mariah Rose Pereira is a singer that many consider to be indie or entirely self-made. This is not true. She moved to Nashville at 14, then at 15 began receiving vocal coaching from Brett Manning, and a year later started uploading covers and original songs to her YouTube channel. So who is Brett Manning? Well, his clients include names such as Miley and Noah Cyrus, Keith Urban, Haley Williams, Taylor Swift, and Debbie Ryan. Sometime in 2013, Poppy had moved to Los Angeles, California with her close friend Debbie Ryan after signing with Island Records. Debbie Ryan starred in Disney Channel's Jessie from 2011 to 2015. Mariah was an extra in the March 28, 2015 episode of Jessie called Basket Case. Reality TV is a place where many are discovered. This is true of Maddie Siegler and Jojo Siwa from Dance Moms. You know, this show. I'm hot. I'm mean. You can't have me. My outfit was pretty tiny. I could fit this on my American doll. The idea with the fan dance is that you cover your body with the fans. So you give the illusion that you're nude underneath the fans. Which, come on, we all know that you have tan bras on and tan tights on. Maddie Ziegler has been heavily involved with singer Sia. Seven years ago, I was asked by an artist over Twitter to shoot a music video. I was 11 and only dreamed of a career as an actress and dancer. That artist was Sia, and that music video was the now iconic chandelier. That experience gave this girl from Pittsburgh the opportunity to travel the world, perform in the most magical places, and get offered opportunities in Hollywood that an 11-year-old could have never imagined. Maddie and Sia are 27 years apart in age and met in 2014 when Sia asked Maddie to be in her music video for Chandelier after she saw her dance on Dance Moms. First of all, Sia has revealed that she sees Maddie as a friend and daughter figure. In this interview, it seems like she's almost about to say that Melissa shares her daughters with her. Would you describe your relationship as a mother or as a sister? Yeah, mother. Mother and friend. In but I mean, only because Melissa lets me, she, that's her real mother. Sia has actually been given the role of godmother for both Maddie and Mackenzie. And in 2019, she called Sia the best person in her life. She even has a necklace that says Sia Heart Maddie. In fact, she has admitted to shutting down opportunities for Maddie by telling Melissa that a movie was beneath her talent and that one of the cast members was not good to work with. But the idea that stars are just like you and that anyone can become the next Miley Cyrus or the Beatles is a lie. Understand that the fame system is rigged. You're up against algorithms, YouTube management, which is the equivalent of talent agents, but for YouTubers, sponsors, and dubious characters like this.
My name is Shiraz Hassan. I'm the founder of Fame by Shiraz, and I make people famous. Some of my clients, Kim Kardashian, Paris Hilton, Jennifer Lopez. Predators use their fame to take advantage of their young, adoring fans. Some examples are Davi Vanity and Lost Profits. It's actually extremely hard to have a moderately successful career in the arts, let alone get rich. So when you see these billionaires claiming to be rich simply due to their talent, you can bet something else is going on. The answer is not to look at everything as being awful. People need music. We need to tell stories to gain new perspectives, give hope, learn things, laugh, reduce stress, or appreciate other cultures. But if you are an artist of any kind and you were given the talent and the gifts of creating, don't be discouraged because fame is reserved for the unfair few. Don't strive for fame. Strive for making an impact in people's lives, even if it's only a few, because unlike the stars millions are taught to follow who change the world for the worse, you can make a positive impact on a few people's lives for the better. Visual social media sites, such as Instagram, Snapchat, or TikTok, are riddled with problematic algorithms and content. 69% of TikTok users are between 13 and 24 years old. The visions of life as a TikTok superstar. TikTok is probably one of the biggest apps and probably my future. Yeah, do, do, do you have dreams of working, becoming a TikTok creator, yes. TikTok influencer? Yes, I love TikTok. All social media can be problematic, but TikTok is particularly toxic for younger people who can't help but compare themselves to the content they are constantly exposed to. The problem is, the more you seek that reassurance, the more you need it. And then, when you don't get it, your confidence suffers. These apps also house dangerous undercurrents of encouraging self-harm and glorifying mental illnesses. The worst part is that anyone can find a community that ends up reinforcing their worst habits. You can pay for fake song downloads on music websites, fake sales of books, and fake reviews of movies. You can pick if your bots are male or female, American or Chinese, liberal or conservative. And right now, there are hundreds of millions of them blending in online, and most people can't tell them apart from you and me. The same kids who grew up criticizing people like Kim Kardashian and Paris Hilton who are famous for doing nothing are the same ones who do nothing and want to be famous for doing nothing. Lotte has copped a brand new Ferrari. Y'all haven't seen this car in your lives. I'm out here flexing and all y'all... The things that little Tay was doing were wild for a nine-year-old, and some people were already thinking that maybe she was being forced to act in such a way. In one of her videos, little Tay is showing off a red Mercedes car, which turned out to belong to her mother's boss and was used without his consent. When this information came to the surface, so did the fact that the houses that the girl showed off in her videos were in fact on the market for sale, because Tay's mother used to be a real estate agent. Her boss himself explains that in a video. This forced Tay's mother to quit her job. None of this was real. It was all made up for fame. Yeah, they think you're famous, and then they think, that's what I want to be when I grow up. In the early 2000s, before social media and apps, message boards were how information was passed around. And there were some message boards with allegations about Dan Schneider being a predator which have turned out to be true. Lisa Lillian, Hungry Girl, is married to Dan Schneider. Now you got, you started out the same way I did. I understand that you started out at like the Laugh stand Factory. Com the, yeah. Are you a stand-up comedian? Yeah, well my, well my dad saw like a, an article that, you know, kids could do a comedy camp at the Laugh Factory. Right. So it was like for six weeks or something, you know, like Arsenio Hall came on and he would like critique your act. Right. And, and Richard Pryor came on. So it was really cool. And then there was like a graduation night and that's where the producers of the show, like Brian Robbins and Dan Schneider, and Dan Schneider. came on the show and they saw me there. So and that, that was cool. it. You just got discovered right off of the comedy camp. Yeah. Schneider is believed to have taken advantage of numerous child actors, such as Jeanette McCurdy, Ariana Grande, Amanda Bynes, and Jamie Lynn Spears. 
Viacom paid for Schneider's lawyers, paid off agents and parents, and paid for non-disclosure agreements. Nickelodeon, Disney, and Viacom are all complicit in the systematic abuse over two decades. Schneider knows exactly how to manipulate people according to the statements made by some of his victims. Harvey Weinstein is another example of this. These are not isolated incidents. In Hollywood, this is the culture. Lindsay is eight years old. She's ready for the beach and she's old enough to know that you see she's got her cooler and she knows uh, that she needs to drink plenty of liquids on the beach, that the sarong can take you from pool party <laughs> now right into the pool. <laughs> hey, Lindsay, wrap it up, will you, kid? <laughs> Children are groomed from a young age to imitate and idolize these change agents who appear relatable. Over time, these change agents display sexualized behavior and the children, who are now teens, more readily accept the new agenda being pushed. They don't see these stars as being sexualized, they see the independence and control aspect they seem to have over their lives. Nothing could be further from the truth, though. They're being manipulated because they are too young when they are initially become attached to these stars, so they don't grasp the overall implications. Your sense of self is still developing, and consuming this type of media entangles itself into your personality. It's almost impossible for children to escape this type of idol worship. When Ariana Grande said God is a woman, I feel like she was talking about Beyonce. Every brand is owned by a bigger brand, and all eventually interconnect. Everything out in front of you is done on purpose and is done to change or shape you in one way or another. Become aware of that, and be careful what you consume. The three largest media conglomerates are Disney, NBC, and CBS. From media, to food, to so-called science, money and power connects it all. Did you know around two-thirds of basic research is privately funded, and that corporations and trade groups tend to fund research that will make them money? You and your family's best interests are not on the radar. Many deny this reality by saying things like, but everyone would have to be in on it. I have three words for you. Ho, ho, ho. I guess that's one word three times, but... We've discussed mental and visual manipulation, but what about audio? Can it be used to manipulate us? The answer is yes. Music is one of the most powerful tools to steer emotion, and I want to discuss a lesser-known form of sound called infrasound. Audible sounds are used to manipulate our moods in TV and movies. Sound effects like a heartbeat cue us into a dramatic scene. But what about sounds we don't consciously pick up on, but are affected by? These are called infrasound. One unsettling and hidden sound that is given credit for freaking out an audience is infrasound. A low-frequency sound that cannot be heard, but literally unsettles human beings down to our bones. Infrasound, which exists at 19 hertz and below, can be felt, but human ears begin to hear sound at 20 hertz. Infrasound exists in nature and is created by wind, earthquakes, avalanches, and used by elephants to communicate over long distances. At a high enough volume, it may be possible for humans to perceive sound as low as 12 hertz, but even common objects can emit infrasound, something some horror movie music composers use to their advantage. 19 hertz infrasound is called the fear frequency and can cause discomfort, dizziness, blurred vision, hyperventilation, and induce panic attacks. Distressed animal calls, women screaming, and other nonlinear sounds, which are irregular noises with large wavelengths often found in nature, were used in The Shining and other movies to create an instinctual fear response, as recorded in the test subjects of a 2011 study at the University of California. During an experimental infrasonic concert in the UK in 2003, Test subjects were exposed to a 17 hertz tone during two pieces of music. According to the study, the mere presence of that tone made about 22% of the audience feel anxious, uneasy, and dizzy. In the first 30 minutes of a 2003 horror film called Irreversible, the almost inaudible background frequency is at 28 hertz, which caused the audience to experience nausea, 
Sickness, and Vertigo. An album for the film was produced by Thomas Bangalter, who is best known for being one half of Daft Punk. Powerful sound and the proper use of lighting are of primary importance in inducing an altered state of consciousness. The television set in your house is doing a lot more than just entertaining you. Phones, television, dance performances, and powerful musical scores can induce an altered state of consciousness. When someone goes into an altered state, they transfer into the right brain. The result is the internal release of the body's own opiates, called enkephalins and beta-endorphins, which are almost chemically identical to opium. In other words, it makes one feel good, and want to repeat the experience. The same high can be seen in addiction, as well as social media interaction and likes. Technology and laboratories have also altered the taste of food so that junk is more appealing than whole foods. Like addictive drugs, highly palatable foods, think processed foods, trigger feel-good brain chemicals such as dopamine. Food scientist Steve Witherly describes Cheetos as one of the most marvelously constructed foods on the planet in terms of pure pleasure. This isn't accidental. Snack food companies do a lot of research in order to design foods that fool your mind and bewitch your taste buds into a constant state of craving, a state industry insiders call the bliss point. Consider a fast food chicken nugget. You're not tasting what little chicken might be in it. The chicken is more a delivery vehicle of flavoring that was created by flavor scientists, not nature. This is deceptive on a cognitive level and alters and disturbs our palates, so that good food simply isn't interesting anymore. If we eat these foods, they are not actually what they seem. Ever notice how much junk food is advertised by big companies, but decent food never gets the time of day? Many processed foods have been redesigned by food manufacturers to be more enjoyable. They can affect the brain's reward system in ways that aren't exactly natural. But don't feel bad if you can't get away from junk food for economic reasons. We can't go back to 1940s-style agriculture where food tasted good and was cheaper. Be angry instead at the corporations who have made it impossible to have access to nutritional food. Our brains are exploited around every turn to become addicted to unnatural things that are not good for our well-being. This is not limited to obvious things like alcohol and nicotine. It includes fake food pornography, television, and media addiction of all kinds, such as video games. These things are designed to be addictive and override our natural brain function. Self-regulation is key. One of the biggest examples of what appears to be disjointed, but is actually a carefully crafted narrative, is what the world lived through all of 2020 and is still enduring. The Battle for Your Mind, written by Dick Sutphin, outlines six conversion techniques used by cults to gain converts. All of these techniques have been used on the world during this ritual. The following are six primary techniques used to generate the conversion to a cult or organization. All these must be preceded by isolation, intimidation, deprivation, and indoctrination. So we just got the news that we're going to be quarantined here for 14 days. The reason for this is to alter internal chemistry, which generates anxiety and causes at least a slight malfunction of the nervous system, which, in turn, increases the conversion potential. The first technique is called the zealot by zealot technique. The new converts are zealots. In this case, the first converts were celebrities and media doctors. Just cover your face because you may be infected. I'm begging of you, please don't hesitate. Because once you're dead, then that's a bit too late. <laughs> Two, wearing down resistance. A schedule is maintained that causes physical and mental fatigue. The participants are given no opportunity for relaxation or reflection. Three, increasing tension. 
from healthcare workers risking their lives on the front lines to families worrying about putting food on the table. It's the most horrifying experience we have. You can see that there's more abnormal lung than there is normal lung. Be the deadliest month on record. 2020 is now the deadliest year in U.S. history. Four, introduce uncertainty about identity. In cults, the participants are concerned about being put on the spot or encountered by the trainers. Guilt feelings are played upon. Participants are tempted to verbally relate their innermost secrets to the other participants. If you do not comply with guidelines, you risk being put on social media and ridiculed by the world. The uncertainty of identity comes in the form of losing your individuality or your identity has been reduced to your costume. This has also turned all of us into a literal horror movie plot device. You're there with your best friend, but then you have to kill your best friend because of this thing that's inside them. And that's what the disease became in cabin fever. You're with your best friend, but you've got to isolate them or you've got to kill them because whatever is inside them could get inside you. And suddenly you're not seen as human anymore. If you saw a neighbor, you kind of waves and you were nervous. It's changed our body language, the way that you just respond to someone. Oh no, don't, don't touch me. Five, jargon. New terms are introduced that have meaning only to the insiders who participate. Vicious language is also frequently used, purposely, to make participants uncomfortable. 6. Lack of humor The final tip-off is that there is no humor in the communications. About a dozen of these refrigerator trucks lined up to hold the dead. At least until the participants are converted. Then merrymaking and humor are highly desirable as symbols of the new joy the participants have supposedly found. Bake is the banana bread apocalypse of 2020. The media shows you you're supposed to be happy and having fun making sourdough bread at home for the 13th month in a row. The untold amount of psychological damage done during this fear-based initiation conversion ritual to children and vulnerable individuals is unknown, not to mention the strategic financial blow. What many consider to be random proves itself as being methodically organized and executed. The 1963 Congressional Report, Current Communist Goals, laid out the instructions of installing communism in the US. This has been done and now is being externalized. Take a look at some of the completed objectives. It's one giant conversion tactic. Everything we experience is propaganda that has worn us down and forced society as a whole to submit to their dogma. I discussed this idea in my Mind Game series. In the next part of this programmed series on psychological manipulation, we will be taking a look at how cults use ritual abuse as a form of mind control. Thanks for watching this first part. See you next time.